Okay, we have a web. Let's, if we can get up there to take a look at this, it might be a miracle, but we'll try. Oh, okay, you. I'm gonna slide down here. But here's our web. This is. That is not Latrodectus. That again is Agalina Day, so a funnel weaver. Um, Latrodectus. What, what, do we, what would we have here in southern Minnesota? So we'd have the northern black widow. That would be Latrodectus variolus. We're out of Latrodectus Hesperus country. We're farther east, Iowa, Minnesota. This is variolus country. Just want to take a look at this. This, this looks like, to me, and my experience with Latrodectus, this looks like where we should look. Uh, high bank, a lot of sunlight, along a water source. Okay, so let's understand this. Uh, the Pleistocene. Why do we keep mentioning the Pleistocene? Because at the Pleistocene, the glacial maximum news, moves north, and now the spiders can come up. That's our, that's our last advancement of Latrodectus. So the, the Pleistocene. So we're down here by Iowa. Okay, this is the lowest, the lowest uh, range of the last glacial maximum. So here in Iowa, the glaciers, re, glaciers start to recede. We're looking at, you know, 12,000 years ago. Not very long. The glaciers recede up into this area of Minnesota and then proceed to recede north, okay? Leaving behind them the glacial till um, and rubble and erratics spread all over Minnesota, boulders. Okay, so that glacial maximum recedes, leaving behind these silts and gravels and creating Lake Agassiz. So Lake Agassiz is a glacial lake about 10,000 years ago. We're talking about the end Pleistocene. 10,000 years ago, that gla glacial Lake Agassiz is in Manitoba, okay, Manitoba, uh, Ontario, northern Minnesota. And down here the spiders advance, okay? Look at this, look at this terrain, look at this sediment on this bank washing out from the river and from rain. This is intriguing stuff. Uh, not only the geology, but spiders utilizing this stuff. From one river to the next, uh, back here in Montana. Why is it so, why is this glacial uh, drift and, and then the, the last glacial maximum so important? Well, it has to do, I guess, for me, it has to do with uh, developmental plasticity, okay? Uh, or, or even uh, habits these spiders take on over, over, over the generations, okay? So, so climate, uh, temperature, all this plays a role. There's a web up here. Let's go get a look. Back here in Montana, of course, this is Latrodectus Hesperus country. Uh, we do have variolus here also, depending on region. Okay. Ooh, there's a widow there. She's up inside there. I don't know if this camera can see her in there. But she is up inside there. Very nice. Now we have climate. Climate decides many things with these spiders. We got night and day. We have season to season. Okay, here in Montana, we have extremes. So the daytime can be 90 degrees. And then in the evening, uh, when these spiders are more active, remember they're nocturnal. The temperature can be down to 40, even lower. And that does play a role in their development, especially with males. Size, okay, especially with males, the size diversity. Uh, Males have that, oh, let's get down here. Males have that terminal investment. There's a term for us, terminal investment, okay? They develop, they breed, and they die, and their life is very short. So from spring to fall, different males at different times, different sizes, because of different breeding habits and different development. That, for me, goes along with cold hot hot cold season to season evening day this all plays a role okay so what about that terminal investment i mentioned okay male latric dectus hesperus males and their development 
okay? Why is there so much diversity in the size of the males? Um, now, let's if we talk about Latrodectus and size uh, variation, now we got to go to Variolus, the northern black widow, which has the most size variation in its males. And again, so that's the northern widow, so we're talking northern regions, and me, of course, I'm talking Ice Age, and then the the, the move north again of these spiders. So this is this is important to me to understand this. So here we have the most variation in the northern black widow. Now is that because of seasonal changes are more extreme? Warm, cold? And then we go back to the Ice Age. Extremes? Is that way? I don't know. I don't know. We, I guess we got to answer that. But the variations, the size variations in the males is more extreme. In Latrodectus hesperus, we see quite a bit of variation. And look at this web. What a beautiful web. There's a funnel back in there. That's her hide. I don't see her anywhere, but wow, look at the lattice work. Beautiful lattice work. Back to males. Okay. So in the springtime males, as opposed to the autumn or fall males, ooh, there's a difference in development, okay? And therefore a difference in size. So you have, okay, we got a male, he was born in the autumn, he overwinters as a juvenile, he becomes adult in the springtime, and therefore he has, I guess, a longer, slower period of development, and he has less females to find. And therefore, he puts off his last molt, okay? So he puts off his last molt, and what happens? He gets bigger. A springtime male, depending on availability of females, which is not much, they're, they're, they're not around yet, he's going to grow bigger. He has more time, a slower maturity a slower pattern of growth. In the autumn, you're going to see scrambling males. There's a lot of females available. You have these smaller males which mature very fast because of the availability of females, and so they don't grow very big. Uh, two different... Uh, two different size differences and, and reasons for that development. And there's a myriad others. Night and day, warm and cold, blah, 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 season to season. All of this is important. Look at this web here. Ooh, sheet web. Latrodectus sheet web. Look at that. I hope the camera picks these webs up as I show them to you. I've had good luck in the past. Nice organized sheet web. We don't see a lot of gumfoot strands. She's probably well fed, uh, probably in breeding mode. Just phenomenal terrain here, these banks. It's such, such amazing Latrodectus hesperus uh, country. Look at this web. Now, this, this baby really, really shows some variation in web development. Textbook. Uh, I guess textbook Therididae webbing from Latrodectus. But look at the lattice work. Complete chaos. So it would seem, of course, we know better. This isn't chaos. This is, this is organized chaos. Because we know the purpose and reason for these strands. And, and I guess uh, I don't need to go into that. I've said it before, but I guess there's redundancy. I guess I could explain it all again. There's nothing wrong with redundancy in science. But we know there's purpose for these strands that look like chaos. But what we can derive right away, okay, observation, interpretation again, what we can derive is all of this web. This, this female, wherever she is inside here, is well fed, okay? She's, she's very mature. She's well fed, she has a lot going on, and she's invested in that. Uh, uh, very important in the development. And let's, let's talk about the males, okay? Let's talk about the, the males. The males are capital breeders, okay? Capital breeders. What does that mean? That's an ecology term we use, our capital breeders, okay? Male Latrodectus are capital breeders, meaning that they, they develop to adulthood, they never eat again, they find a mate and die, okay? Capital breeders. 
They do not eat as adults. Now that's interesting. We might not even have thought of that before. But the males, after they reach adulthood, don't eat. They don't eat. Their whole life is spent looking for a female, following the scent of pheromone, tracking her down, then finding web, trailing that web, uh, breeding and dying, okay? They don't eat as adults. They are capital breeders. And so males don't have these big, beautiful, elaborate webs, okay? Because the males just don't have the time in their life. They, they, they're juveniles. They make a web. After they balloon away from mama, they go. They, they fend for themselves. They make a small web. They eat a meal, have another molt, and then that is it. They go and search for a female. And they, and they breed and they die. Capital breeders. That's another ecology term we can, we can use now. Okay, yeah, I, got, I got something for you. I just popped into my head. Let's go to uh, Mady Ann Andrade, okay? At the University of Toronto Scarborough. Mady Ann Andrade, if you could read her work. She's done a lot of work on this. A lot of work on the stuff I'm talking about. Okay, that's what I'm all about. I'm about the research. I'm about, let's apply the research to what we see in the field. Okay. So, let's, let's go look up Median Andrade and the Andrade lab at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Ooh, this is beautiful after deck this country. Montana.